Player 3 has entered the game. WRX90, Threadripper Pro 7000 series. Gigabyte's got the MH53G40 with some unique features, but it's really designed for enterprise and workstation use, not, not quite so much enthusiast use. They're going to stick to the uh, AMD specifications, but we're going to take a look at those unique features because, hey, onboard Broadcom 10 gigabit and compatibility with Broadcom RAID cards? That warrants a closer look. Let's dive inside. I mean, if you're buying this, you're buying it because you already know what it is that you want, not because of something on the box. So, I like the minimalistic boxing. This, this is a ginormous EATX motherboard. There's no gamer bling here. There is nothing here that does not absolutely, necessarily, positively has to be here. And there's a warning sticker over the uh, lithium ion cell because when they wrote the laws to deal with lithium batteries and laptops that catch on fire, they didn't exclude lithium coin cells, which do not catch on fire and have never caused a problem. It makes shipping a little more complicated. Is that tiny and not overbuilt VRM? I mean, that's the first feature that you notice about the board. It's not overbuilt, but it'll get the job done. TDP of up to 350 watts are supported on the Threadripper Pro platform, which means you can run a 96 core CPU with this. Fully eight memory channels supported. And you've got a crap load of PCIe Gen 5 redrivers scattered all over this board. We also have six X16 Gen 5 slots, onboard out of management control, and of course our dual 10 gig uh, network adapter, which is powered by a Broadcom chipset. We also have an eight lane MCIO connector. If you follow this channel, you know that mini cool IO is the connector of the future. This gives you eight PCIe lanes, so you could run two X4 uh, NVMe, or you can do like I did and run eight hard drives, eight SATA hard drives, because you can put that in SATA mode and then it'll give you an eight breakout connection. And those are direct CPU attached lanes. The four SATA ports here actually come from the chipset. So not super important for SATA, because SATA is not terribly fast, but it goes through the chipset and into the CPU in case you're curious. The four main M.2, those are all Gen 5, but we do actually have a 2230 here, which is an E key, which is designed for Wi-Fi. So you, technically you have five M.2 here, but it's really four for storage and that is up to 110 millimeter. Uh, and then the other one is for Wi-Fi. This motherboard also features an optional TPM 2.0 header. You have to get Gigabyte's breakout header for that, but if you want off-board TPM, which may be important if you're an Unreal developer, check out our Unreal development on Threader for Pro video. I don't know why that's happening. There may be a system stutter on Windows with TPM. Linux, of course, doesn't care. Linux is fine. Because this motherboard supports four onboard GPUs, well, the GPU can draw up to 75 watts through the PCIe slot. It does have an extra six pin 12 volt power connector and you will need to connect that if you intend to power four GPUs through this system. In general, it's probably recommended just for system stability. The other two eight pin connections can carry 400 watts each, but given the CPU is 350 watts TDP and can peak a little over that, yeah, you probably wanna connect both of those eight pin connections. Got our 24 pin motherboard connection here. And that's pretty much it for this platform. If you're gonna build a workstation out of this, as opposed to a server, you are going to need to use a high airflow chassis, something like the big Fractal North Excel, which will give you a little bit of room at the bottom of the edge of the motherboard where things hang off, so that if you wanna run that fourth GPU, it's gonna extend past the, uh, the end of the motherboard if it's a dual slot card. Uh, also, the Fractal Torrent is a good choice for this motherboard because there's really not a lot of uh, superfluous VRM cooling here. It's going to be up to you to have a lot of airflow. The other thing that people don't realize is that the Threadripper Pro platform really depends on good airflow over the DDR5 memory. A lot of DDR5 registered error correcting memory is designed for use in server applications, rack mount server applications, which are extremely high airflow chassis. And you don't always get that in a workstation configuration. I can't tell you how many threads there have been on the level one forums where people have had an issue that was either directly because of the DDR5 memory running too hot, which in some, I mean, depending on the brand of memory, that can be as low as 65 degrees C, or they had a problem that was related to, but not 
directly because of overheating memory, like overheating memory was a contributing factor. This motherboard also features a 30 pin USB connector, which is at a right angle, so if you had an extra long GPU, it would clear it. None of the other bottom edge connectors are right angle, but they're all small connectors, things like fans, so it's probably not gonna crowd your GPU too bad. And then of course, we've got a USB type C connection at the top edge of the motherboard here, so it would work for a workstation. We also have front panel audio connections and your basic you know, 5.1, 7.1 type audio output on the back. It's just three analog jacks, nothing fancy. Now, Gigabyte motherboards have a feature that they've added to the A-Speed IPMI for fleet management. They call it Gigabyte Server Manager. And there's also a module in it for uh, Broadcom stuff specifically. So in addition to having the Broadcom LAN, if you have an add-in Broadcom RAID controller, like my Broadcom RAID controller here, see it's eight PCIe lanes on this side, Gen 4, and we've got 16 PCIe lanes on this side. When you install a peripheral like this in the server, this card will be exposed to the IPMI um, from Gigabyte and they can do monitoring. And so this is what's called a tri-mode adapter. You could use NVMe connected to the 16 lanes that you have here generally. I think a software-based solution for NVMe RAID is a better choice, but if you're running a mix of, say, SAS SSDs and, you know, maybe SATA SSDs and you want some sort of large storage pool, then something like this RAID controller can make sense. And the out-of-band management that is on this platform from Broadcom will provide um, a dashboard for out-of-band management specifically with the Broadcom adapter. So it's a, it's a unified platform like you would get from an OEM like Lenovo or Dell or HP, except it's from Gigabyte. So overall, this board doesn't have a lot of gamer or enthusiast features, but those features are what the enterprise actually wants. And I also really like that Gigabyte on all of their boards, on all of their M.2, for the last five or six generations on both Intel and AMD platforms, they have a hardware temperature sensor that physically touches the actual M.2 for monitoring temperatures, which is great. The only thing left to do with this board is to do a build and see how it does. All right, the build is in. Fractal North XL, it's a good choice for this case. Just zipping straight to the results. I had to use an Asus Gen 5 M.2 adapter to do the Gen 5 testing. This actually did work, which is an improvement. Gigabyte's Gen 4 adapter didn't really work all that reliably in non-gigabyte motherboards for whatever reason, but Asus's Gen 5 adapter with Gen 5 M.2, like the uh, Crucial T700, of which I have two, that's an SSD that I took a look at previously. It looks pretty good. Also, the MCIO connector. You have a cable like this, which is your single MCIO connection, and then you've got two U.2 that get SATA power. So these cables can be a little tricky to find. Um, this one is the longest one that I would recommend that you use. Don't use ones that are longer. The redrivers on the motherboard were able to interface with their Keoxia Gen 5 SSD without any issues. I also tried uh, Gen 4 uh, Intel P5800X and some other drives like that and the MCIO connector worked at both Gen 4 and Gen 5 speeds with the right cable. Now, you can get an MCIO cable from like AliExpress that one doesn't work in anything. I haven't been able to get that to work at all. But for the, uh, you know, the, the HL15 home lab build that I did, which has dual MCIO connectors for four U.2 Gen 5, basically those same cables worked great for driving Gen 5 SSDs. Fantastic. I tried adding a lot of GPUs. I wanted to push the envelope to see if I could get four or five GPUs in there or six GPUs for all, all the slots. Physically getting all the GPUs in there, you're gonna to need to use riser cables or something like that. I think four GPUs is probably the safer bet just in terms of power delivery and everything else. This is a relatively conservative motherboard. It is meant for workstations and for a workstation it really does work. And you actually do have some PBO overclocking headroom. So yeah, you can give the, the CPU an extra 40 watts or so and it's basically fine. In our Fractal North XL under the worst case torture test scenario, the VRMs are gonna push like 90, 95 C, which is a little toasty. Keep in mind, there's no active cooling. There's no fans on this motherboard. I know that some of you are not fans of having motherboards that have fans on the VRM. And you know, for Asus, for their WRX90, they've got giant heat sinks. ASRock, for their part, well, they don't have giant heat sinks, but they do have five tiny little fans. This motherboard doesn't need any of that because it's designed for a high airflow case. Really, that means like a server type case. We're just getting away with something that works in the Fractal North XL. And so I think that's something that I probably should revisit in a higher airflow case because 
that motherboard will actually let those CPUs boost a little higher until the VRM gets pretty toasty. And then it'll back off and settle down into that, you know, power envelope that we sort of expect for normal Threadripper Pro CPUs. For 96 core Threadripper CPUs, if you can deliver 500 watts, upwards of 1000 watts, that's pretty nice. You can just turn on PBO and PBO at like 750 watts on a 96 core seems to be pretty stable. That's not a guarantee should you, you know, overclock your workstation. Well, it's really weird. The way that you should think about it is with 96 cores, there's a lot spread out over a large area. And if you can cool a lot and spread out over a large area, you're not really overclocking. Okay, well, I mean, yes, technically you are overclocking, but think about it this way, 32 cores, and the amount of power that you get per core, you move from 64 cores, the power that you get per core is cut in half. So at 96 cores, you've got a third of the power per core. In general, these CCDs can actually run at a much higher wattage. They just don't at the default power envelope. And so with these Threadripper Pro motherboards, I have sort of been enjoying giving those 64 and 96 core CPUs a lot of extra power with near zero side effects, but you need insane cooling and you're a little bit of a, an experimenter. You're a guinea pig, you're a, you're a pioneer. And you're gonna run into rough edges, sharp edges that you can cut yourself on like ASUS's BIOS updates and memory compatibility and that sort of stuff. But this motherboard being pretty conservative, made for mass deployment and workstations, doesn't have as much headroom as its other counterparts. I don't necessarily see that as a negative thing though, because if you're paying $10,000 for a CPU, are you going to even push the envelope a little bit? Like for me, for my machine, yeah, that sounds good. But if I were deploying this for a team of, you know, a dozen talented artists and creative types that were gonna use 64 or 96 cores, I don't think I would do that because I wouldn't want them to call me if something goes wrong or sideways, unless they really were enthusiasts and they really understood a lot of the mechanical things that go into it. So all in all for a, conservative workstation motherboard, not really meant for enthusiasts. They're gonna go way far off the reservation. This is a perfectly competent WRX90 motherboard. If you are an enthusiast and you're looking to overclock and you're, you wanna get a world record with the 96 core, mm, probably not the motherboard for you. But if you want a workhorse that is going to be stable and run everything in the lines and pretty reasonable Gen 5 support, even on the slots that are close to the end of the motherboard, yeah, this is a pretty good choice. And I like seeing the MCIO connectors. Might have been nice to see two eight lane MCIO connectors instead of just the one that would set it apart competitively. But hey, this isn't bad. I can't ask for more. It does everything it's supposed to do for WRX90. And depending on what region you're in, has pretty aggressive pricing compared to the competition. Again, depending on the region. So Gigabyte's MH53G40, not a terrible choice for WRX90, especially in that conservative workstation high airflow build. And this is sort of the minimum of high airflow. You're gonna have to get that dual 180 millimeter fans for the top and run it with a full airflow configuration in the front. For cooling, the Arctic 4UM tower cooler for you know tower cooling is my first recommendation for Threadripper Pro systems. If you want an AIO, there's pretty much only one option that's reasonable, and that's Silverstone. Silverstone has two options, actually. One's the Ice Gem 360, and then there, there's another one that they've been working on that's native SP3 support. But yeah, Silverstone makes an AIO for Threadripper Pro. They do, and it's a pretty good one. Some more details on that coming up. I'm one of this level one has been a quick look at Gigabyte's WRX90 motherboard, the third WRX90 motherboard that you can get, period. And it's nice to see that it does what it's supposed to do, which is amazing. I'm one of those level one, I'm signing out. You can find me in the level one forums. So if you have any questions or you want to see a particular build that runs through a particular workload, let me know. All right, signing out, I'll see you there.